Hello and welcome. I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today. Today our webinar is uh, going to focus on cloud-based Microsoft SQL, uh, covering uh, both HA and DR and what the must-haves are to uh, feel good about putting that environment into the cloud. Uh, joining me to help with the conversation is Tony Tamarchio. He is the Director of Field Engineering for SIOS. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me here today. You're welcome. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this. Uh, in, in this webinar, we're going to hopefully give you uh, four key takeaways, uh, the advantages of a hybrid or full cloud Microsoft SQL environment, uh, the limitations of those environments when it comes to providing HA and DR, um, some, some of the difficulty of implementing Microsoft SQL in a hybrid fashion, and then how to overcome those uh, and, and provide a, a true uh, full HA and DR uh, for both on and cloud-based uh, Microsoft SQL environments. Just some few logistics. We'll start the presentation in a minute. Uh, all the audio is through your speakers. There is no dial-in, so if you're looking for a number, uh, just turn up the volume on your speakers. Uh, a recording of this presentation and others can be viewed at any time without having to re-register. Just go to storageswiss.com. Uh, there's a, a webinars button uh, that you click on and all the webinars will be there. Also, if you're an iPad, iPhone, or Android user, there's a pretty nice app available for all of those platforms that provides the ability to both stream and download the app, um, the webinars. Uh, the way you get that is to go to your appropriate app store, uh, search for Bright Talk, uh, which is the platform that we use for the webinar, and then uh, search for, once you get that installed, then just search for our channel, which is uh, the Storage and Server Virtualization Resources channel. So that should get you there. Uh, be on the lookout for a couple of polling questions. We've got a few here in the uh, presentation. Uh, answering those helps us to fine-tune the presentation to make sure uh, we're giving you the information you want. Uh, you can also customize a presentation further by asking a question specific to your use case. You know, what what are you struggling with? Maybe something you didn't understand. Uh, go ahead and ask a question. There's a little button in your player there called Ask a Question. You can ask those questions at any time. Uh, we try to take them uh, in line, and we also have a, a good section of time at the end to uh, go through all those. Uh, if you're an on-demand viewer, uh, uh, we get many on-demand viewers, uh, please go ahead and tweet us questions at Storage Swiss. Uh, just give us some indication as to what the webinar was, and, and that will help us to understand uh, sort of the point of reference. And then finally, if you would, at the end of the presentation, please take a moment to provide feedback and then rate today's webinar. Again, there's a Rate This button uh, in your player. So let's uh, get some background uh, on, on the speakers that you'll be working with today. Uh, Tony, why don't you go ahead and give us some background on yourself? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, George. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Tamarchio. I'm the Director of Field Engineering here at SIOS, uh, and I'm responsible for the pre-sales technical team supporting our customers, partners, and also prospects who are looking at our technologies. Uh, I've been with the company now just over four years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I spent time at uh, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, and you know, various startups really focusing in the areas of high availability and systems management. So I've been in the space for quite a while and uh, excited at the opportunity to uh, present to everyone here today. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, so from my uh, standpoint, for those that don't know me, I'm the founder of Storage Switzerland and also its lead analyst. Uh, we've been... Um, I've been doing that for about eight years now. Uh, prior to that, I was CTO at a large storage integrator and have about 25 years of experience designing uh, storage and disaster recovery, uh, as well as high availability type of solutions uh, for data centers throughout the United States. Uh, just some background on Storage Switzerland. Uh, like you could probably guess, we're an analyst firm uh, focused on storage, cloud, and virtualization. Um, we gain knowledge of these markets through a variety of means, including product testing, interaction with end users and suppliers, uh, and that could come in the form of uh, actual implementations, uh, just discussions afterwards, uh, follow-ups, audits, things like that. Uh, you can find results uh, of this research on our website, storageswiss.com, and those 
can be uh, articles, case studies, videos, webinars like you're on right now, uh, product analysis. Uh, there's also uh, podcasts and all kinds of different things. So pretty much any way you want to consume information, uh, we're delivering it to you in that appropriate type of media. In general, we tend to add two to three new pieces of content a day. So not only do I encourage you to come every day, but I encourage you to come a couple times a day. Um, so, Tony, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us some background on SIOS? Sure thing. Uh, so SIOS, uh, formerly known as Steel Eye Technologies, we've been around uh, since 1999, so well over a decade protecting uh, mission-critical applications and data for our customers. Uh, we're a global organization. Uh, we're headquartered out here in California, and we've got offices throughout the world. Uh, supporting thousands and thousands of customers worldwide, protecting many different types of applications uh, and data, whether that's SQL servers, file servers, you know, Hyper-V configurations, Oracle, you, know, you, you name it. We can protect really any application uh, or data. Uh, we really focus in two key areas, and that's high availability and data replication. Uh, we're focusing here today on really on our SQL Server and Windows solutions. We do also have uh, solutions for Linux systems as well. And we enable HA uh, in both SAN and SANless configurations. We'll certainly get into this in more detail as we go through the webinar. Uh, and you can certainly visit us uh, at uh, us.sios.com if you want to get more information uh, on our technologies. Thanks, uh, Tony. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. So the uh, – oops. I skipped a slide there. Just, so just to kind of go through the agenda real quick, uh, we're going to talk about sort of the state of application, high availability, uh, traditional, uh, you know, kind of where do the traditional solutions fall short, and then talk, kind of introduce a new uh, concept in, in looking at this, more of a software-defined, abstracted approach uh, to uh, SQL high availability. Uh, and how we can lower TCO as a result of that. And then we'll wrap up with uh, Tony giving us an overview of the uh, uh, SIOS solution. Uh, the, the webinar is designed to be very interactive. Tony and I will be uh, bantering back and forth as we go through uh, each slide. Uh, again, you can participate in that uh, interactivity by uh, asking a question, and where we can, we try to bring them in live. Let's start, though, by uh, getting you uh, kind of warmed up. Uh, polling for a polling question, uh, what percentage of your business critical applications are running in the cloud, in, in the public cloud right now? So let's go ahead and push that polling out. Again, what percentage of your business critical applications are running in a public cloud? Uh, a would be 0 to 25 percent, B would be 25 to 50 percent, uh, C would be 50 to 75 percent, and D would be 75 to 100. And then just go ahead and select A, B, C, or D as it uh, as it makes sense. Uh, so Tony, right now we got uh, uh, we got a zero to twenty five percent jumped out uh, to an early lead at fifty percent. Uh, about thirty percent of the viewers are at twenty five to fifty percent, and then we've got a few that are in that um, higher end category, uh, the seventy five to one hundred percent. Any any surprises there from your standpoint? No, no, no surprises. Um, you know, we definitely see customers who are in all stages of, uh, you know, moving to the cloud. A lot of folks are, are certainly new uh, to the cloud environment, um, and as part of that, they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to move up to the cloud, how do I protect my applications and things like that. So, um, yeah, it looks like that number is growing. Most people are coming in, and it looks like the, the number one response is, you know, zero to 25 percent. That, that's, that's not surprising, but we do engage with customers on a daily basis. Uh, that are looking to you know, move mission critical applications like SQL Server up to the cloud, and and uh, we 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 have ways to help them achieve uh, high availability and, and disaster recovery as they make that transition. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's very interesting because I think there's a lot of um, uh, people that are you know, people use the cloud for different things. I think that a lot of what I see nowadays is people using it sort of. Instead of uh, bringing a bunch of equipment in and, and rolling, you know, test dev and doing all that initial work, they might now do that in the cloud and not bring that application back on site until it's ready to go production. So I think that um, that's part of that that's factoring in here as well. 
so we we end with about 62% uh, that uh, have somewhere between zero and 25% uh, in the cloud. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, pause the voting right there. Uh, now, the other thing we want to take a look at is, and, I, and I'm going to break a cardinal rule of webinars, and I know that you guys are all very forgiving, uh, so I, I can get away with it. But I also want to find out real quickly, of, of that percentage that, uh, and really everybody obviously can answer here, but what's your biggest concern as you run business critical applications? So if you're in that 0 to 25% category, this question is almost tailor-made to you. Um, if you're in the, uh, but even if you're in those other categories, any of these concerns, is it security, is it being able to provide application availability, is it disaster recovery, is it being able to maintain some form of performance, is it having uh, cloud-related skills? So we'll, we'll let people uh, answer there and we'll um, uh, go from there. So I'll give it a few seconds for the first set of answers to come in. And Tony, we're seeing um, kind of all over the place. Uh, it's um, interesting. Nobody's concerned about disaster recovery. Uh, that kind of hurts a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, and you know, security. Uh, I actually would have thought that that was going to come out as number one, but uh, uh, it and application availability are uh, kind of running neck and neck. And then maintaining performance, interestingly enough. Uh, is the number one answer. Um, and then uh, cloud-related skills, I actually expected that to go last, and uh, that's a concern. Any any uh, surprises with these results? Yeah, I, was, I would definitely expect, uh, now actually the numbers are changing a little bit, we're starting to see some disaster recovery and uh, application availability answers, but you know, that's certainly what we, you know, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is, um, you know, once you made the decision to, make, to, to move up to the cloud, you know, obviously security is a concern, you know, because you're putting your data and your applications really in somebody else's data center. Uh, performance is a concern because, you know, it's, it's, it's a virtual infrastructure up in, up in the cloud. You, you don't necessarily know, uh, you know, what type of, uh, you know, hardware or things you're getting underneath the covers, although you can uh, specify, you know, how many cores and, and things like that you want from a performance perspective. Um, but, uh, Certainly, application availability, and once you put your app, your mission critical application up in the cloud, making sure that it doesn't go down. Uh, that's that's generally what we hear as a as a, a top concern. Yep. Well, and of course, the performance of a downed application is really bad, so uh, it kind of falls exactly. in there as well. So, okay, we'll go ahead and stop the voting there. Uh, security, not surprisingly, was number one, and then we had a lot of different answers uh, throughout the rest. So I appreciate you guys uh, working with me to break the rules and ask two polling questions in a row, but I knew you could handle it, so thanks. Uh, from a uh, – let's, let's also talk uh, sort of – Tony, let's talk broadly here, sort of the state of application availability and kind of what's changing in the environment and things like that. You know, to me, the number one thing that I see when I speak with end users today is there's just a increasing need to be always available. I, I, I wonder now if we can even ask the question, uh, you know, how much downtime, downtime can you afford? Because my, my fear is that for most business uh, line of business owners, uh, they're going to say zero, right? The, the expectation is that you're always uh, up and running. Uh, I was in a CIO's office um, a few months ago, and as I was in there, a, a, a line of business manager walked in. He was complaining about some application outage. It was actually scheduled outage, and the guy said, well, Facebook is never down. And, and so, you know, uh, the IT guys are now being compared to Facebook as far as availability. Definitely. What's your and, thoughts on that? Oh, oh, for sure. So, you know, in the past, uh, you know, hours, hours of downtime might have been acceptable. You know, we, we talked on a daily basis to folks about their recovery time and recovery point objectives, the so RTO and RPO, and, you know, where in the past uh, it might have been okay for, you know, an email system or a database system to be down for an hour or, or a couple of hours while, you know, somebody fixes the issue and brings it back online. But, you know, these days where you've got, you know, customers that are connecting in from, you know, around the globe, you need to be up 24 by 7, and, and, and typically folks are, you know, looking at recovery time objectives in the in the seconds or minutes, you know, definitely not in the hour plus time range anymore. And, and because of that, you know, you definitely need to be always available, and uh, a cluster is really the best way to, to achieve that and, uh, you know, achieve a, a very tight recovery time objective to make sure things just don't go down, or if they do, they come back online very, very quickly. 
Exactly. Yeah, and then I think the other thing, of course, is, you know, the, I, I haven't run into many data centers uh, lately that said, oh, yeah, we just got our, our, our budget doubled. Uh, you know, most of the time it's it's flat or a few percentages of growth, uh, more so than anything else. So, you know, there's this uh, overriding need to be cost effective, which which I find it's kind of funny that always available and cost effective are on the same slide, right? It, it, that seems somewhere wrong to me. Um, but are you when you talk to customers, are you seeing this ongoing pressure for uh, availability? I'm sorry for cost effectiveness. Oh, certainly. You know, being able to do more with less, uh, being able to uh, always be online with the server and storage infrastructure you have in place, uh, that is definitely, uh, that's definitely a, a discussion topic with our customers uh, on a daily basis. And, you know, oftentimes the, the way that you achieved HA traditionally is, you know, setting up a traditional shared storage cluster, but that's, you know, very costly, very complex. And we'll get into some of the, some of the other limitations there, but, uh, you know, doing more with less um, and, and increasing your uptime at the same time is, is, is definitely a challenge for customers. Right, exactly. And I, and I think finally the other big kind of state of the state um, change that we see is that, uh, being available or, and keeping uh, this always available state and also being able to run in a cost-effective manner is no longer just an enterprise concern, right? I mean, we, we see a consistent demand uh, for smaller and smaller businesses, uh, certainly in the mid-tier, uh, to meet uh, almost the exact same uptime requirements as uh, others. I, I Just a quick story, I was at a public, uh, literally a public storage facility trying to get some of my stuff out, and I forgot my, the combination to my uh, closet, whatever they call them. And so I had, I went to the office to have them look it up for me, and their systems were, which actually they run on a kind of highly distributed SQL environment, their systems were down. And I, I couldn't get in, and I'm like, really? I can't get into my, <laughs> they didn't have an override or anything. I couldn't get into my system. The whole uh, gate uh, system was all electronic and triggered through that, and so nothing would operate without that thing being up. And this is a relatively small business. They had like four or five locations, and, you know, they needed to have this type of availability. Do you see more and more kind of midsize uh, businesses requiring uh, this type of uptime? Definitely. We, we see all different size businesses requiring this, this level of uptime, anywhere from, you know, the big enterprises that have thousands of servers and, you know, lots and lots of databases all the way down to, you know, the, the small business who, who today has a single SQL server running on a, on a single machine and, you know, it, it's powering their website or their point of sale system or, or some mission critical application and it just can't go down. If it's down for five minutes, you know, their business stops. So that's just not acceptable. Yep, exactly. All right, so let's uh, let's kind of talk about. So we've confirmed that you know we want better availability and we want to do it in a cost-effective way. Let's talk about sort of traditional uh, SQL clustering and, and kind of where it falls short. Uh, you know, obviously in general, most clustering solutions today, certainly the ones from the operating system vendors, uh, require shared storage. Uh, that just straight out of the shoot increases uh, at some level complexity and cost. You, you've got to buy a dedicated SAN, typically a dedicated uh, infrastructure to, to support that SAN. Uh, and you know, but the storage system still becomes a single point of failure. Most most systems, uh, you have multiple uh, servers all sharing the same data off of the same storage. So I, I got that right, Tony. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, traditional clustering. Um, you know, Windows Server failover cluster, uh, for example, that's exactly how you would deploy it out of the box. You know, two or more servers with some type of shared storage. Um, you know, that SAN is, you know, complex to set up, costly, but you're, you're exactly right. It's also technically a single point of failure. Um, sure, SANs have a lot of redundant, uh, you know, components, redundant controllers and, and disks internally and things like that, but you know, oftentimes it's maybe not a hardware failure that took down the SAN. It could be, uh, you know, an administrator uh, error or, or something else that took out the shared storage. And if the shared storage goes down, well, now your entire cluster is down. So um, it, it does, in fact, represent a single point of failure. You know, the whole idea behind a cluster is to eliminate as many shared or as many single points of failure uh, as possible. So you've got redundancy at the server level, the network level, the storage level. Um, so, yeah, that definitely is, um, you know, one of the limitations of, of traditional shared storage clustering. 
Yeah, and if, if for if any of the attendees have ever attended one of my uh, data protection workshops, you know that I go through uh, pretty good detail on uh, how often we've seen uh, a shared storage system fail, whether it be a firmware issue or somebody pulling the wrong drive, and any number of things can go wrong, and, and it can be a problem. And, and I think, though, uh, Tony, even bigger is as we start to kind of reference this in sort of the cloud conversation, SANs really aren't cloud ready, right? That they really were designed at, always to be on premise, have high speed, low latency type of connections. They're they're not really designed to be in the cloud. And and frankly, even if you could put it in the cloud, I don't know if you'd want to because all you're doing is moving the cost from an on premise location to an off off premise location. Correct? Exactly. I mean, the whole concept of shared storage really doesn't exist, you know, up in the cloud. If you you know, are firing up, let's say, instances up in Amazon EC2 or, or in Azure, uh, you're, you're essentially given a set of virtual machines. Uh, each of those virtual machines has their own set of, you know, Amazon calls them, you know, EBS volumes, elastic, elastic block storage. Uh, but basically, each, each server up in the cloud has its own independent storage. So you can't take those disks and share them between different uh, different servers up there to, to achieve shared storage. I mean, there, there are ways you can do this with extra software or things like that, but again, you're back to, um, you know, even if you do set up shared storage uh, up in the cloud, again, that's, that's a single point of failure. If the system in the cloud that's running and acting as the shared storage has an issue, well, that can take out your entire cluster. So moving to a, uh, a SAMless configuration, also referred to that as a shared nothing clustering architecture, really does you know, up your availability, um, you know, by a notch because now you're also eliminating uh, the storage as a as a point of failure. Right. And then I think finally just kind of wrap this section up, the, the other big challenge is that it does require uh, specific uh, enterprise class licenses that also raise uh, pricing, correct? Uh, correct. If you're looking to, you know, for example, SQL Server, um, Starting with 2012, there's the uh, always on availability groups feature. Yeah, that that does give you a HA for SQL, but it's only available in Enterprise Edition. So if you if you're looking to deploy, you know, SQL Standard Edition up up there, and you know you don't want to make the jump to Enterprise Edition just to get HA, um, you know, setting up a, a stainless cluster powered by Silas is a uh, is, is a great way to, to to achieve that. Okay. So let's um, – and, and, you know, it, it what's interesting is anytime there's a gap in IT, a, a flood of different products appear, right? We, we see it in Flash. We see it in data protection. We see, you know, I can't believe the number of backup software applications there are. I mean, and I think there's no – there's, it's certainly not an exception here, right? With all of this stuff, we've seen uh, people try to add re replication or um, – uh, continuous data protection, things like that. And, and you know, the, the challenge with those sort of things is you start to build, you know, kind of almost a house of cards, right, where you're trying to figure out how to integrate those applications into a, a SQL application. And really what you end up with is a, is a lot of moving parts that, that really in, increase not only the integration process, but also how you manage that environment. One of the big challenges I see typically with these environments is, knowing for 100% certainty that your SQL environment is actually being protected. It, 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 verifying that can actually be very time-consuming. Do you guys run into – do you guys see that as well? Certainly, yeah. The, the, the biggest enemy of a cluster or HA is complexity. You know, the more moving parts, the more things um, can go wrong, the more, the more things can possibly fail. So you definitely want a solution that's, uh, you know, integrated and just works seamlessly together. You don't want to manage your SQL failover separately from your data replication and, you know, make sure that if you do failover SQL from, you know, one system to another or from your data center up to the cloud, you don't want to have to then remember to, uh, you know, tell the, the data to start replicating the opposite direction or verify that the, rep, that the data has been replicated up to the cloud or over to your other data center before you you, you, you fail it over there. So, yeah, definitely having, you know, uh, an integrated solution where both HA and replication work hand-in-hand, hand, that's definitely going to make your life easier um, and eliminate, you know, possibilities for things, you know, things going wrong. And, of course, you know, something's always going to – you're not going to want to have to deal with this at 3 in the morning when a system goes down. It's never, you know, uh, conveniently at 10 in the morning when uh, you're sitting in front of your desk. It it's always seems to be in the middle of the night when you've got this issue, and you don't want to have to deal with, um, you know, 
too many moving parts. Uh, you want it to be as simple uh, as possible when you when you come up with a uh, you know your availability strategy. Right, and of course, all of that leads to a higher t cost of ownership. You know, anytime we're talking about complexity and more moving parts, the in general. Uh, right along with that, the upfront purchase price is higher, and the total cost, the operations cost is higher, uh, and, and frankly, the risk uh, becomes a little higher. So the whole TCO model just tends to uh, get higher. So, so let's talk about for for the you know we had an interesting group of respondents in our poll there. Uh, we have hopefully a lot of people considering you know does it make sense for me to put uh, Microsoft SQL in the cloud, and if I do, how do I do it in a highly available fashion. So let's, um, Tony, let's talk about some of the things you just got to have to make this make sense for you. So I, I think the first thing is we don't want to recreate all the complexity and uh, operational headaches uh, that we had uh, in, in the kind of on-premise model that we were talking about, right? And so to get there, I think that uh, we have to really develop, uh, you know, kind of jump on the software-defined uh, term and use it for clustering as well. And, and, and frankly, it makes sense because the cloud itself is in large extent software to define. So using uh, software defined HA clustering kind of makes a whole, uh, whole lot of sense in the environment. Uh, and, and it really allows you to sort of protect the whole environment, right? And the other big thing though is that this has got to be storage agnostic. And to your point earlier, in the cloud, we really don't know what the storage system is, right? We, we it, it could be a whole different, many combination of different things. There's probably not a SAN. There's a lot of variables there. So it just has to be straight out agnostic to whatever uh, it's going to end up being deployed on. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. Now, when you provision systems up in the cloud, you basically tell it, you know, how many how many virtual CPUs do you need? How many how much RAM do you need? How much storage? And then you know there are, there are certain options where you can say I, I need you know uh, higher performance storage or the regular storage or things like that. But but at the end of the day, you really don't know what lives under the covers. You know, you just know, hey, I've got this Windows operating system where I want to run SQL Server, and it's got this much CPU uh, RAM and storage and and when you come up with a strategy for making sure that it's highly available, uh, it, it can't be dependent on the, you know, the, the physical infrastructure under the covers. So a software solution um, that, for example, layers on top of the clustering that's part of the operating system with Windows Server, you know, that, that's important. Um, so making sure that it basically can replicate, you tell it which drive letters you want to you protect, as an example, and, and we don't care if, how, you know, if that's... Uh, you know, rated storage, or if it's you know shared storage, or if it's you know if it's just an EM, uh, EMBK or an EBS volume, or whatever happens to be attached to that VM, it's just got to work. Okay, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So then let's talk about the other one. Is you know quite obviously it's got to support both. I mean, this isn't obvious, but it's got to support private and hybrid cloud deployments. As I kind of mentioned earlier, a lot of what we see is a, a, a shifting sort of cloud usage where you might do um, development, initial production in the cloud, pull that application on premise for a period of time, maybe you know a private cloud type of setup, uh, and then as the application for whatever reason uh, winds down, you know, kind of goes into legacy mode, move it back up to the cloud. So the ability to be uh, you know, very flexible in, in the deployment strategy is also important, right? And so I think we kind of hit on the importance of uh, not requiring uh, shared storage there. Uh, and then, but I think that second bullet there is really key is, is making sure that the data can be synch synchronized across any uh, sort of infrastructure topology. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think it's it's really key here that, you know, whether you're deploying your SQL applications up in a public cloud or a private cloud or hybrid cloud or even, you know, on, on traditional physical servers, you don't want to have to deal with a different solution in these in these different environments. You want to go with, you know, the, a, a, a technology or a configuration that will work and, again, is you know, server and storage agnostic. So, um, you know, by, you know, setting up a SAMless cluster, really, really, really when I say the word SAMless cluster, what I really mean is a shared nothing configuration where different nodes in the cluster have, are connected to different, different uh, independent storage. You know, whether that are virtual disks or LUNs on a SAN or what have you, you know, that really, that doesn't matter. Um, 
and the ability to uh, synchronize the data so that when you fail over from, let's say, your SQL, your primary SQL server that maybe lives on-premise, uh, you fail it, you know, up into the, the, the system running in the cloud because you've had a disaster and your primary data center went down. Certainly making sure that the data is synchronized in real time so that your most up-to-date data is up there in the cloud, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely mission critical. You certainly wouldn't want to fail over to another data center or to a, a cloud environment if your data wasn't all there. So, you know, being flexible to work with really any server and, and storage, whether it's physical, virtual, or cloud, uh, as well as ensuring that your data is protected in real time, um, you know, those are definitely must-haves in these types of configurations. Well, I think that that model you just described also helps our group of guys that were in that sort of lower threshold of deploying mission-critical mission apps in the cloud, right? One of the sort of the for lack of a better word, the sort of safe ways to start with this process is to keep your, you know, keep your primary application on site, but leverage synchronization and everything to leverage the cloud as your DR uh, location for your application, right? Yeah, that's definitely a good first step that we see customers take all the time. You know, they've got existing infrastructure in their data center. You know, maybe it's uh, some physical servers. Maybe they do already have a SAN and they're doing SQL clustering today. But, you know, they want a very simple, cost-effective way to achieve, you know, disaster recovery without having to build out an entire second data center. So the cloud is great for that because you can, you know, provision a server up in the cloud, and you know, that can be an extension of your, of your cluster and replicate the data up there. So if you do lose your data center, well, you can fail, up, fail out over to the cloud uh, fairly easily. So, yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very common first step that we see, you know, where people are getting comfortable with, uh, you know, cloud deployments. And, uh, but we also see plenty of, uh, of companies and customers who, who put everything up there. You know, we have lots of uh, configurations where, you know, the entire cluster, you know, all, all tiers of an application, maybe perhaps the web, the app, and the database tier, everything's up in Amazon, as an example. So uh, it, it's really, it's all over the map. Uh, people who are just starting to get into cloud and people who put, put everything up there. Okay, great. So, and obviously cost was a big factor that we talked of, uh, talked about when we were talking about sort of the state of uh, Microsoft SQL. Uh, you know, so I think that, you know, one of the key things is it's really got to be um, infrastructure agnostic, right? We've talked a little bit about this already, the ability to use commodity resources, to use um, capacity or storage wherever it may be located, and to leverage, you know, CSP type of sites for low-cost DR. We talked about that as well. Hey, let's talk a little bit about operational simplicity, um, Tony, because I think that that's one of those things that's really easy to say it's simple. It's a little bit harder to prove it's simple. But you know, talk about how some things that uh, can be done to sort of make things um, simpler. I think, like you said, one of the uh, the I can't remember the exact way you said it, but you know, complexity is sort of the bane of uh, any clustered uh, infrastructure. What can we do to make that simpler? Sure, sure, definitely. So when you when you talk to uh, you know DBAs, definitely anything that involves you know a, the SAN. I mean, SAN is almost like a four letter word to them. You know, anytime they need more storage or they need to configure something, they're dealing with generally another team that maintains the SAN. So that's you know complexity. Um, the turnaround time isn't as always, you know, as fast as they might want it to be. So, you know, from a simplicity perspective, I mean, it, it really doesn't get any simpler than, you know, taking, let's say, two servers that, and leveraging the storage that's already inside the machine uh, or provisioning up two servers up in the cloud and, again, leveraging the storage that's attached to each one. So you're really you're eliminating the extra steps of, of, you know, setting up the SAN or reconfiguring the SAN, you know, and it's not just the SAN, but it's all the infrastructure that goes along with that, you know, the, the, the switches and, you know, the configurations and things like that. Um, and really just, you know, taking the servers themselves, making them into a cluster, and, and that's it. And, and the, the glue that kind of holds this together is, is the replication software, for example, that SIOS provides that, you know, keeps the storage in sync and is, you know, server and storage agnostic. So, you know, a, a cluster where, you know, the only components involved are the cluster nodes themselves, you know, have extra, you know, storage arrays or things like that that are getting in the way or, or also potentially could fail, you know, that really, that really simplifies things, especially in virtual environments. You know, provision up two instances, you've got to, you know, add some SANLESS uh, clustering software on top of that, and you've got everything you need um, to, to make this happen very easily. So, and I think, I think Tony, that's a really good setup for 
talking about how you guys do this, because I know that you guys can help uh, address many of these uh, sort of must-haves, if you will. So why don't you go ahead and kind of just take us through uh, your guys' solution and how it uh, kind of attacks some of these must-have requirements. Certainly, I'd be, I'd be happy to. So just to step back a little bit, if, we, if you take a look at the diagram, it's the top left here, you know, if I say the word cluster, uh, this is this is what people would would think of, you know, two or more physical servers with some type of shared storage, and you know, that's that's probably the most common cluster configuration you see out there. Now, uh, again, you know, the store the shared storage represents cost complexity, also single point of failure, um, but for uh, what's problematic for cloud environments is really that the concept of shared storage again just doesn't exist. Um, and the way that most people are protecting SQL Server and ensuring its, uh, its availability is uh, using the native Windows Server failover cluster uh, technology that's part of, of the Windows operating system. But that by itself, it has a hard requirement on shared storage. Um, so if you're looking to deploy a native SQL cluster, uh, which will, you know, has a lot of advantages because it's protecting the entire instance and uh, it's compatible with distributed transactions. I've got a slide that goes into the details of why you would want to, you know, set up a, a, a traditional failover, SQL failover cluster uh, up in the cloud. Um, that's not possible unless you have uh, shared storage. So up in the cloud, if you look at the bottom uh, diagram here, you know, this would be an example of a cluster deployment up in the cloud where uh, leveraging SIO software here, we can uh, replicate the storage from one system over to another system. This is purely a software solution, sort of block-level, real-time replication. Think of it really as a, as a software RAID 1 mirror, uh, but going across, across the network. So you have a block-for-block -block replica of your disks between these machines. Um, the technology is fully integrated with Windows Server failover clustering, so it looks and it acts and it feels like a traditional SQL cluster. We're really just abstracting the storage, making local storage, uh, pr we're presenting that to the cluster and making the cluster think that it's shared. Um, and all at the same time, we're replicating it block for block so that all of your data is protected. Now, if, uh, let's say, your primary server on the left fails and the secondary server comes online, it will also switch the direction that the data gets replicated in. So now the source and target roles will switch, data starts replicating the opposite direction, and you don't have to worry about, you know, main, uh, managing or maintaining, you know, the mirror and the data protection separately from, uh, you know, the, the failover process. So it's just all very seamless, all very integrated, and, you know, unless you looked, you know, under the covers, you really wouldn't know that this is different from a, you know, an out-of-the-box cluster. It's just really we're eliminating the shared storage requirement from a traditional SQL cluster, um, which, really, which, which works really great in any type of environment, especially the cloud, or especially in multi-site uh, configurations where perhaps you have a node on-premise and a node in the cloud, and you need that mechanism to protect your data and synchronize it to get it uh, sent up to the cloud uh, so that you can fail over uh, if and when uh, it's needed. So um, we have customers um, that, you know, deploy uh, configurations all locally. You know, we also can certainly deploy your entire cluster up in that cloud. Um, you know, we have a lot of cluster, uh, a lot of customers who, you know, have put their entire infrastructure up into, up into, for example, Amazon EC2. Um, now, when you do a cloud deployment or a cluster deployment where everything lives in the cloud, you generally want your instances or serve virtual servers up in the cloud to live in different availability zones, which is an Amazon term, or fault domains, which is an Azure term for maximum availability. Um, and certainly our software would keep the storage replicated and, and synchronized between nodes that you can fail over within the cloud. Uh, but um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, oftentimes, you know, the first baby step to, to cloud deployments is, is a hybrid uh, configuration where you've got an existing SQL deployment, you know, whether it's a standalone SQL server or an existing cluster, and now you want cost-effective, let's say, disaster recovery up to the cloud. So the diagram that I have on top is uh, what I refer to commonly as a two-by-one cluster. And this is typically where you have an existing on-premise SQL cluster with shared storage, and you want to easily extend this. You want to add a third node 
where we replicate the data, and then you can fail over to the cloud as, as needed. So uh, this is really also a hybrid storage config where the two servers on the left have shared storage, the third server on the right, it's got its own independent storage. So you have the flexibility to, to mix and match, where in this case, you know, some have shared, some have local storage, some of the servers are on-premise, some are up in the cloud. You know, this, is, this is very achievable here. This is what our software uh, easily uh, allows you to accomplish. Now, if you don't want to deal with shared storage at all, that's, that's really what that bottom diagram represents, where perhaps you want both local high availability as well as you know, disaster recovery up into the cloud, but you don't want to use the SAN that you've got because it represents a, a single point of failure, or perhaps you don't have a SAN and you don't want to invest in, in, in a SAN. So this is what I'll call a one-by-one-by-one one one cluster. Really, the, the number that I'm, I'm saying out loud, it really represents the number of servers that are connected to that particular disk. So in this one-by-one-by-one one one configuration, in this example, I've got two servers locally. Uh, each have their own independent storage. It just could be the, you know, the internal SAS or SATA or SSD drives you know, inside the box itself, and then the third system would be up in the cloud. Now, these types of configurations, you know, a multi-site cluster, also known as a geo cluster, it really is the best of both worlds. It's both HA and DR in a single configuration because you can fail locally. You can also fail over to the remote site, whether that's another data center you might have or, or uh, a system up in the cloud. Uh, cost is also uh, a big factor these days. So, uh, especially with SQL deployments, with SQL 2012 and newer, you know, Microsoft moved to this new per core pricing model, and the cost went up significantly. Uh, SQL 2012 also introduced uh, uh, what's called always on availability groups, uh, which is basically database level replication, um, and that gives you a way to uh, achieve high availability for SQL. But unfortunately, it's only available in the enterprise edition of SQL Server, which is significantly more than standard edition. So, you know, for, for those of you that don't need all the bells and whistles that come along with um, SQL Enterprise Edition, but you still want high availability, um, you know, a SANless cluster, a silos powered SANless cluster is a great way uh, to achieve that. You can see some of the numbers here on the slide. Um, that just, you know, depending on the number of cores, whether it's four cores or eight or 16, you know, the amount that you can save on your SQL licensing uh, is very, very significant. If you look at that, um, uh, just below those arrows, if you look at the light green bar, you know, that's the, the licensing cost for the SIO software. So uh, the amount that you're spending on, you know, this extra software to achieve sandless or shared nothing type clusters is, is practically nothing compared to you know, your, what you're going to be saving um, uh, from a, a SQL licensing perspective here. So very compelling from a, a cost perspective as well. Now, on that, that, on that note, we've been talking about always on availability groups, which is built into SQL Server, but again, it's, it's for enterprise edition only. So one of the most uh, commonly asked questions that I see is, well, what's the difference between you know, using always on availability groups and then using a, a silos powered failover cluster here. Uh, and there are actually a lot of differences here. So we've already t covered the first bullet point, which is, you know, support for standard edition. Uh, also, availability groups isn't, um, isn't compatible with all applications. So if your applications rely on distributed transactions, so if you, for example, are clustering MSDTC today, that's not available or that's not compatible with availability groups, but it is compatible with a SAMless cluster from SIOS because, again, we piggyback on top of native failover clustering here. Uh, also, uh, a SAMless cluster protects the entire SQL instance, not just certain user-defined databases. So your system databases, so master, MSDB, your SQL logons, your SQL agent jobs, all of that gets protected and failed over, whereas with availability groups it doesn't. Um, also, if you have data that lives outside the database, you know, perhaps there are some flat files or PDF files or some, you know, some type of data that's important for your application, but it just doesn't sit in the database, maybe it's on the file system, you need to protect that, um, because our replication technology is, again, server and storage agnostic, we're block level replication, we can replicate any data, not just SQL data. So we can protect the entire application environment as well. So a lot of, a lot of key differences. Uh, you know, again, some of the, the, the major ones, again, are, you know, the, the support for standard edition, uh, the significant licensing uh, savings that go along with that, and then really protection of the entire 
SQL instance, not just certain uh, user-defined databases here. So, um, you know, to kind of wrap up some of the um, key takeaways, some of these must-haves that you need to worry about when you deploy uh, SQL Server in the cloud, and you have to worry about HA, you know, Silas really delivers that. Um, first of all, ease of use, you know, because we piggyback on top of native clustering, it's, you know, if you've ever set up a SQL cluster, you know, let's say on-premise uh, in the past, you already know 95 plus percent of what it's going to take to do to deploy a SQL cluster, you know, in a, in a different environment such as the cloud. So very easy to, to, to set up and to deploy. Uh, again, you're achieving a higher level of availability because uh, the storage is no longer a uh, potential single point of failure. You're also eliminating the cost and complexities that go along with uh, with SAN deployments. And uh, you know, again, you have the flexibility to deploy this in public, private, or hybrid cloud environments. And and not only are you eliminating the shared storage, uh, but but to reiterate on some of the points we made previously, shared storage just really isn't isn't available uh, up, up in the cloud. So that's, that's in the past, that would have been a showstopper to deploying a, a, a traditional cluster. Um, and then also, uh, our replication technology is very fast and efficient. So for, you know, back, going back to the poll that we reviewed earlier, where performance is a concern, uh, you know, you don't want your replication engine that's protecting your data to uh, degrade the performance of your SQL Server. So we have a very fast, efficient block-level replication technology that keeps the data synchronized uh, between your systems with, with uh, minimal overhead here. Uh, so I guess with that, uh, George, I'll turn things back over to you, and we can see uh, uh, what type of questions have popped up through our session here. Okay, great. So before we get to the questions, uh, just a couple reminders. Uh, the attachments button has uh, all kinds of nice goodies for you. Uh, there's uh, a couple of different uh, articles that we've written as well as uh, some uh, uh, reports and white papers that the uh, team from SIOS has uh, put together for you. So you can get those without having to do any more registration. Just click and uh, download them. Uh, as, as a reminder to ask a question, just simply click on the Ask a Question button. And then finally, um, if you would, on your way out, uh, please rate the webinar. There's a star rating system. Five stars is the best. Uh, one was uh, kind of not so much. So uh, please rate as you see fit. There's also a little feedback section there if you want to uh, type in a note there. Uh, what I always suggest is uh, type in a, a, a suggestion for a uh, follow-on webinar. Uh, if there was uh, something you wanted to see covered in more detail. So, um, uh, Tony, with that out of the way, let's uh, kind of hit some of these uh, questions that have come in. Again, to ask a question, just hit the Ask a Questions button. We've got a good stack in the queue here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go with this one first, Tony. Uh, is, is your solution compatible with all cloud services, Google, Amazon, Azure, SoftLayer, et cetera? And uh, do you have a solution for Oracle as well? So I guess it's two questions in the price of one, but let, I'll let you take them. Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, so the the answer to both at a high level is yes. So our our solution, we're we're purely a software solution. Again, we're we're server and storage agnostic. So uh, we will work in any physical, virtual, or cloud environment. So for example, if you're deploying a SQL cluster up in Amazon. Our software doesn't know that it's you're in Amazon. We you install our software into the Windows operating system, and really all we care about is that you're running a supported version of Windows. And we support Windows 2008 R2 and, and everything newer. Uh, so the fact you know whether it's you know one hypervisor or another under the covers, we really we don't know. We don't care. We're going to protect. Um, we're going to replicate the storage that's presented to whatever server you're using, again, physical, virtual, or cloud. We're going to replicate that storage to protect your data. We're going to integrate with failover clustering and uh, make sure that, you know, you can deploy a, a SQL cluster um, you know, without that shared disk requirement. So kind of a long-winded way of saying, you know, yes, it'll work, uh, you know, with, with any type of a physical or a virtual environment as long as you present block storage to the systems that you're looking to protect. And, and, and uh, the second part of that question about Oracle, uh, yeah, our, our data replication technology, because it's block level, you know, the, the replication engine actually sits right underneath the file system. Because of that, we can protect any type of data. You know, it could be SQL data, it could be Oracle data, it could be PDF files, it could be, you know, text files, 
could be custom application data. We're going to protect that and replicate it in real time, either synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, so this can certainly be used for more than just SQL. Um, you know, most commonly in the Windows in the Windows space, you know, number one, we're doing SQL clusters. We do a lot of uh, file server clusters as well. Um, you know, on premise, um, we do a lot of you know physical server and Hyper V clusters as well, where you want to do a Hyper V uh, cluster without any type of shared storage yet still want live migration and things like that. Um, uh, we do plenty of Oracle clusters, SAP clusters, you know, you name it. We're all across the map here. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Let's let's do the next question. In, um, and you might want to kind of uh, refresh people on what these are, but the question is the, the two-by-one and one-by-one address failover for application on-premise to the cloud, how do you fail over for a, a SQL server already in the cloud? So why don't you just kind of remind everybody what, what the two-by-one and one-by-one one, uh, failover was first. Certainly, certainly. So the, so the two-by-one configuration, uh, that was referring to a cluster configuration where you have two servers connected to shared storage and then uh, perhaps you're adding a third node that has its own independent storage. You know, that configuration, you know, all three of those systems could be on-premise or the first two might be on-premise and one in the cloud. Uh, so it's kind of a, a hybrid configuration. But we certainly can also um, protect you if you want everything deployed up in the cloud. So, um, you know, if you have an existing SQL server that you've already deployed, let's say, up in Amazon EC2, and it's sitting there, you know, really unclustered, unprotected, and now you want to protect that because you're putting a real workload, it's gone production, what have you, uh, it's very simple to protect that. You know, uh, provision up uh, another instance up at Amazon, uh, ideally in a, in a second availability zone, so you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, um, and then you would form a cluster uh, entirely up in the cloud, where the two cluster nodes would be two different uh, Amazon EC2 instances, as as example, and we would replicate the data between those two, um, and we would fail over your SQL uh, SQL Server between those those two systems that are both up in the cloud. So uh, right. again, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no problem. So Tony, on the so the next question up is um, is application performance uh, impacted by using a sandless cluster? Is, is that uh, something that folks need to kind of budget for and get like extra processing power or something? Uh, no, the, the our, our replication engine has very low overhead. We're talking you know less than one percent CPU and you know two to four megabytes of of RAM for our for our driver. So it's really it's it's really it's negligible here. Um, so you don't need to, you know, over-provision your systems to, to account for this. So, however, you know, whatever system specs you would use, you know, for your SQL Server or, or the clustered system, you know, that, that's not going to change. Now, what um, you do need to be mindful of is um, you, know, you do have the ability to replicate data either synchronously or asynchronously. So it really depends on your business's recovery point uh, objectives here. And, you know, this has nothing to do with our technology, but it's really the classic, you know, sync versus async argument, where with synchronous replication, there's zero data loss. But the nature of, synch of synchronous replication means that it's a double commit. So the data isn't acknowledged, or the write isn't acknowledged as being completed until it's made it to both sides, both your source and your target. So, you know, round-trip latency between your systems will have some effect on the write performance down to your disk. Read is not affected at all. Now, on the flip side, with uh, asynchronous replication, you know, it's, um, it's with, with asynchronous repl replication, it's a single commit, um, but there could be some in-flight data that gets lost if you have a hard failure. So it's, that's the classic sync versus async, um, you know, trade-offs here, uh, that as a business you need to decide, you know, what, what's more important. You know, do I want zero data loss, but it's okay if my write slow down a little bit, or can I not, you know, um, sacrifice one ounce of performance, but maybe a little bit of data loss is okay. So you have to make that decision. Okay, great. And and uh, we've got time for a few more questions. So if you've got a question for um, Tony, please please go ahead and uh, put it into the system by clicking on the Ask a Questions button. Also, before we continue with the question, I just wanted to, to alert everybody to the screen there. Uh, we've got uh, various contact information for both uh, Storage Switzerland and SIOS. So, uh, feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any uh, needs for more information. Uh, let's see. The next question, uh, Tony, is uh, how does the solution fit in with uh, SQL always on? 
Um, any specific advantages over the native Azure uh, local redundancy and geo redundancy? Sure, sure. So, so always on. I think the question is really referring to the always on availability group. So always on. Um, there are really two pieces to always on. There's an always on failover cluster instance, and that's really just a new name for um, you know Windows Server failover clustering. So, uh, or a SQL a SQL cluster. So there's uh, an always on failover cluster instance. And then there's always on availability groups. And the always on availability groups is the database level replication. I mentioned uh, on one of the previous slides some of the key advantages that an always on failover cluster instance has over that. And more specifically, a failover cluster instance that is powered by SIOS so that we're doing the, the disk level replication. So uh, again, some of the, the main advantages is A, the ability to uh, with a failover cluster instance with SIOS, the, avail the ability to do this with standard edition of SQL, uh, the ability to protect the entire instance, not just certain user-defined databases, uh, compatibility with all applications, including ones that rely on distributed transactions, um, the ability to replicate data other than just your SQL databases, and also uh, it's going to have a lot less uh, administrative overhead because uh, going back to the entire instance protection, if you create you know, a new database, um, it's automatically protected. You don't have to worry about adding it to an availability group or doing the initial synchronization or things like that. So a lot less involved uh, in that. Okay. Uh, and, see. you know, Tony, we we had uh, somebody uh, give us some feedback as they were kind of, I guess, tuning out and gave us a rating and everything. And I think it ties into that, but just to kind of really drive the point home, uh, any comparisons between uh, Azure and AWS and specifically how your software would, would – uh, uh, act in those environments? Sure, sure. So I, I don't have uh, a comparison between Azure and AWS themselves, um, uh, but what I can tell you is that our software works the same way in either environment. So again, we're server and storage agnostic. So um, we will deploy, you know, you can use our software to deploy a SQL cluster or a file server cluster or you, you name it. Uh, again, it could be Amazon, could be Azure, you know, could be virtual machines in your own data center that are running on VMware, or it could even be physical servers. So, um, you know, I, I can't really go into the detail about, you know, what are the, the nitty-gritty differences between, you know, the Azure infrastructure and the Amazon infrastructure. You probably want to, you know, go to them and, and ask them why they're better than the other. But, you know, from our perspective, we're agnostic. You know, we'll work in either of those environments. It really just depends on, you know, which one you want to leverage uh, as part of your, your your cloud strategy there. Well, and that's actually a good thing. That way the, the user is not forced to pick a substandard uh, HA tool uh, because, or, I'm sorry, yeah, because the cloud offering is better or vice versa, right? So this allows you to kind of make those decisions separately, pick the, the cloud offering that, you know, really nails it for you as far as a, a business is concerned, and then the HA uh, conversation is something that, you can address and, and, you know, make sure you have best of breed in both camps. Uh, just, uh, let's, let's hit one final question here because um, I think it's a common misconception that I'd really like to see you address is don't public providers, cloud providers, already have HA, HA protection? Sure. That's a, that's a great question. And I have to say yes and no, right? So uh, the cloud providers provide a lot of, you know, redundancy, but most of this is all at the infrastructure level. So, for example, you know, Amazon has what they call availability zones, so that if there is an issue, it, it would only, you know, it's not going to take down systems that are across different availability zones. Um, you know, if uh, basically a VM up in the cloud dies, you know, it'll get restarted, things like that. But inside of the virtual machine or inside the server, really that's kind of the black box. So if you were running SQL Server up in the cloud and, you know, perhaps the underlying infrastructure was fine, but maybe your SQL Server died or, you know, maybe there was, you know, a configuration issue or maybe there was, you know, something like the virtual NIC, you know, had uh, an issue. Those types of things generally aren't going to be detected and therefore fixed by, you know, what I call hypervisor layer HA. So by deploying a native SQL cluster on top of that, you know, you now get, you know, the, the best of, of both. You get, um, you know, they're looking at the, the underlying infrastructure, make sure that comes up, you know, stays up and is redundant. And then we're providing failover for everything that lives inside of the, you know, virtual operating system that you're deploying. So um, 
know, what I'll call hypervisor HA, really that's only a partial solution. Um, but if you really need true HA, you want it to be application aware, you want tighter recovery time uh, objectives, that's where you would go with a with an actual cluster. Yep. Yeah, and I think that application awareness that application awareness is critical. You know, we've seen a lot of times where uh, you know an application has crashed, but you can still ping the server, right? So exactly. having that level of uh, detail is really, really important, especially in a cloud where you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily walk over to the server and see it, right? So I think that level of awareness becomes even more critical. Well, um, Tony, you know, we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, thank you very much uh, for helping us out on this uh, webcast and uh, providing the folks some information on uh, Microsoft uh, SQL in the cloud and how you can get a, a highly available environment. Great. Thanks so much for having me here today. No problem. And I want to thank all of you all for uh, tuning in and appreciate your attendance today. We had uh, really good uh, questions and uh, good um, retention. So thank you very much for that. Uh, again, the contact information is on the screen. The attachments are there for you to use uh, and, and have access to. Uh, just click on any of the links or download any of the PDFs that you're most interested in. And then finally, as you uh, go ahead and hang up, uh, go ahead and rate us on the webinar. Again, one being not so good, five being great. So uh, we appreciate your attendance today and have a great day.